actually, I really want to ask you about life on other planets too, because <laughs> th there's this there's this study that's out now, uh, this new this new story saying that this mystery radio signal in deep space is showing activity according to predictions. And we've been hearing more and more about the deep space radio signals. And of course, the implication here is, hey, maybe there's life out there that we're picking up uh, messages and signals from intelligent life. Uh, and so how do we look at stuff like that as it relates to the universe, the size of the universe, the age of the universe and such? And so anyway, more with Dr. Grady McMurtry coming up. Also, don't forget, go to his website, creationworldview.org, and just check out all of the information there. Uh, you can educate yourself to the facts of creation over evolution. So Creation Worldview. Dot org, and of course, order the newsletter while you're there. And more with Dr. McMurtry next. You're listening to the Bob Duco Show. Continuing our discussion with Dr. Grady McMurtry, former evolutionary scientist, now creation scientist, and just all around good guy. Uh, how long have we known each other, Grady? It has been over 20 years. I think it's in the neighborhood yeah. of 22 years or so. Uh, a while. Like I know. My you goodness. Know, time, time flies when you're having fun. And we, uh, <laughs> and we just keep on, we just keep on kicking, don't we? Okay. Yeah, so we just keep on having fun. I know. I know. Tell me about it. So yeah, I know we were talking yeah. about some political stuff, but I want to ask you about. Uh, I mean, we've talked to creation science many times over the years, and of course, as as we say all the time, the scientific evidence itself shows that the Earth and the universe are not billions of years old. They, they don't look like they should if they were billions of years old. You know, people say, well, right. well, was God deceiving us by making things look old? No, they don't look old. The universe looks like it should look if God created it a few thousand years ago. The Earth looks like they should look, like it should look if it was created a few thousand years ago. And that's, that's the information I know that you get out a lot. Uh, but I, I've been seeing a lot of stuff in the news about these mystery radio signals from deep space. Uh, that NASA keeps picking up on. And here's another one from today. Headline, mystery radio signal in deep space shows activity exactly when scientists expect that it. And this is a radio, fast radio burst 121102, such with 157-day repeating schedule, if you will. Um, and so they're trying to figure out what those are. But the implication is that maybe this isn't just some kind of natural signal phenomenon, but maybe yeah, this is yeah. some kind of intelligent message being sent from the gamma quadrant somewhere. Uh, first of all, what is your take about the repeating radio signals from deep space when we see those kind of stories and what we should versus should not read into that? <laughs> I wouldn't read hardly anything into it other than uh, SETI had to close down for lack of money and they're looking for a way to raise funds. Uh, the fact of the matter is that these, what are called FRBs, are fast radio bursts. We've we've known about them. We've been looking at them since 2007. So 13 years. This is nothing new. But I mean, yeah, we just had a burst arrive, and it was predicted because we had a burst arrive 157 days before, and we found out what the cyclical period of that particular burst is. Now, it's traveled 3 billion light years to get here, according to, you know, the evolutionary a way of thinking about things. Now, I don't agree that it's 3 billion years old, but if it were 3 billion years old, and if it had anything to do with civilization, they're long gone. But we know that there is no such thing as these aliens. And when you take a look at the reports, you find out they say, oh, this is coming from a star, like a pulsar type of thing. You know, a, a, a object in space, which is, yes, repeating, but it's a totally natural phenomenon having nothing to do with any intelligence outside of God. And there are some speculations it's uh, from a black hole, uh, something happening there. And so this has nothing to do with intelligent life form. Um, and so as the common term is these days, it's a nothing burger. You know, you, you can't do anything except measure that it's happening. And you get all the speculation on where it's coming from. And then when you take a look at where it is coming from, it has nothing to do with alien life. It has nothing to do with intelligence. It is simply a natural phenomenon. Right, right. So, which to me makes perfect sense. Now, it then begs the question, uh, what about 
life on other planets, okay? Because I, I, there are even Christians who will say, well, my goodness, uh, would we really be the only life that God would create throughout the entire universe, a, a universe this large and vast? And and, and just for, for full disclosure, Grady, I mean, I've always told my audience my position on this is God is God. He can do what he wants. Okay, if God chose to create some kind of life somewhere else in the universe, that's his business. But I would personally be very surprised if he did because it would seem inconsistent with a lot of things that I see in Scripture. And I have no problem whatsoever uh, having having us as the only life in the universe that he created with all those stars, trillions of stars out there. Big deal. There's trillions of grains of sand all over planet Earth, and not a single one of them has a name etched on them. And so what's wrong with God filling up the universe with a whole bunch of great larger grains of sand called stars and planets and galaxies and everything else? Uh, we behold his glory. We behold the beauty of his creation. That's all part of what it is. Why does he have to generate additional life on each one of those to justify all that space being used? Well, the Bible does say that God does, decorates the universe for his own good pleasure. That is true. Mm-hmm. However, God does tell us that this is the only place in the entire universe where there are people. It's Psalm 115. This is the only place there are people, the only place that there are sentient beings made in the image of God. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ came here and died once for all. When God uses the word all, he means all. <laughs> You know, there's many biblical references that tell us that this is the only place where there are people right. that can sin and be saved and experience salvation. Now, again, there is nothing in the Bible that precludes God from making planets in other places, and we do know of over 4,000 individual planets outside of our own solar system. Uh, and that's just in our little corner of the galaxy. Mm-hmm. Um and none of them that we have found so far couldn't support life. But but if God wants to make a planet someplace that can support life in what's called the the Cinderella zone or the habitable zone, uh, such as Earth is, um, and that there are plants and there are animals there, there is nothing in the Bible that says that can't possibly be. But it's pure speculation to suggest that there is, but it could be. Mm-hmm. But there's no people, there's no aliens, there's no, you know, there's no, nobody out there with other civilizations and spaceships zooming around their portion of the of the universe. And the Bible is very specific about that. And then if we take a look at science, science can only say what is when it's been found. So the, the point is, all of the science fiction writers in the world, all the people who want to speculate about life and Star Wars and Star Trek and et cetera, et cetera, doesn't make it real. Right. And until science actually finds alien life form, what science says is it doesn't exist. Well, it doesn't exist until we find it. That's the that's the existential part of science. Mm-hmm. It is just just that portion of it, the, the rationalistic existential part of science. If we haven't found it, it doesn't exist. So it doesn't exist until we have found it. Mm-hmm. Well, we haven't found alien life forms. We haven't found, and as I said, SETI shut down for lack of any alien life signals out there anywhere. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that it seems to me that if God created life, we'll say intelligent life somewhere else in the universe, uh, to me there's some huge questions that, that come into play. I mean, I would, I would be curious, first of all, would, would those Klingons or Vulcans or whatever, uh, would they have had sin infect their world, yes or no? Okay, if the answer is no, then Scripture is wrong because all of creation, we're told, has been affected uh, by sin entering the earth. So what happened in the Garden of Eden here on planet Earth affected the Klingon Empire, okay, somewhere who knows how many light years away. That doesn't seem like it would make sense. And then if sin did enter that world over there, did Jesus go there 
to die for their sins? Well, if he did, then scripture is wrong because it said he died once for all. Mm -hmm. So, and, so and his blood the then would have to spread to the uh, to the gamma quadrant. Yeah, well, that's just it. The, we are told in the scripture that the universe was perfect initially, mm -hmm. and that because of human sin, death and decay came into the universe. Right. There, therefore, Paul writes, and he says, in essence, and I'm not quoting, but he says, in essence, that the farthest atom in the universe from Earth was affected by human sin. Therefore, it is impossible to have aliens someplace else that would not have a sinful nature if they existed at all. Right. And to fulfill God's righteousness, then they would have to hear the plan of salvation. And yet, again, the, the Scripture says that that's not the case at all. That, that, that this is the only place there are people made in the image of God, that they that nothing made in the image of God exists anyplace else. Mm -hmm. right. That Christ came here, died once for all, and that he is the second Adam, and that because of the sin of the first Adam, death came into the universe, and because of the second Adam, at Jesus Christ, and his death, burial, and resurrection, that he does away with death. Right. Well, that can only happen in one place, one time. That's here. No, I agree. I agree. You're listening to the Bob Duco Show. Continuing our discussion with Dr. Grady McMurtry, former evolutionary scientist, now creation scientist. He's the founder and president of Creation Worldview Ministries on the web at creationworldview.org. Uh, great website, a lot of information there, scientific information. So go there, order uh, the newsletter while you're there, too, because I love getting the newsletter. Again, it's creationworldview.org. Uh, let's go to your calls. Any questions at all that you want to ask Dr. McMurtry, whether it's creation science questions, anything about science in the Bible, creation evolution, uh, the Bible itself, or maybe even questions politically, as we were talking about the conventions earlier. So off to the phones we go. Uh, we'll start with Paul in Clinton Township. Paul, you're on the Bob Duco Show with Dr. Grady McMurtry. Yeah, hi there. And uh, I like your show, and uh, I would like to say it's been about a month that I'm listening to your show. Well, thank you. I kind of like it. Well, There's thank a you. That, uh, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things that I like it. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit too much about politics, but well, anyway. I know. I'm, Two I'm, months before an election, what am I going to do? I don't need no more uh, whatever. I do believe that he's doing a good job. Yeah. But my question is this. I always had my own theory. The Earth exists because all the other planets are the filter, the air. They, they give us the life. I don't think there's another life out there. I don't think so. Okay, I don't think there is either. But actually, uh, Paul, you bring up an interesting point. Grady, one of the things that people don't realize about our own solar system is how God designed the solar system in a way that benefits benefits here on Earth. Uh, it's kind of an anthropic principle, kind of principle. But it, I mean, like Saturn and Jupiter, and certainly Uranus and Neptune. These large, giant gas planets on the outside of the solar system actually serve to protect uh, the Earth from a lot of yeah. incoming asteroids and things. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that. Yeah, in astronomy, they're actually called shepherding planets because they their gravity helps to deflect comets and asteroids that would otherwise hit us. Well, and of course, we have college, what's uh, what's that, Paul? When I went to college, I was few, uh, fooled by because the the sun is round, so I figured that uh, something a body like that maybe there are four different kind of uh, world out there, you know. But uh, with the growing older, I came to the conclusion is uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah. That sounds good. Listen, I appreciate uh, your call. Thank you so much. And folks, tell you what we're going to do. We're going to get to more of your calls just a couple minutes from now. Any questions at all for Dr. McMurtry, 877-8282-BOB. Let's see. We, we do have an open line, so give me a call, 877-8282-BOB. More of your calls next. Also, go to Dr. McMurtry's website, creationworldview.org, and order the newsletter while you're there. It's a great newsletter. I love getting mine. I know you'll love getting yours. We'll take more of your calls next. You're listening to The Bob Duco Show, continuing to take your calls for Dr. Grady McMurtry, 
Former evolutionary scientist, now creation scientist. Let's go back to your calls. We'll start with uh, Matt in Sterling Heights. Hey, Matt, welcome. Well, maybe not. Oh, boy, you know what? I, uh, it's, it's line three. We've been having problems with line three. Matt, I'm sorry. That's probably our fault, not yours. But, Grady, I want to ask you the question that Matt, I, I see here, was going to ask, because I thought it was a great question. Okay. Uh, he was going to ask, what about the fact that uh, Jesus said he sent his disciples into all the world, go into all the world? Uh, doesn't that mean just physically planet Earth? Uh, so how does that apply as far as the rest of the universe? Well, since the Kl- I would I would think since there's no Klingons, therefore there's no Klingons to witness to. So therefore, it's not going to all the universe. The reason it's going to all the Earth is because the Earth is the only place where there are people that need to hear the gospel. Well, that's just it. And the word "world" has multiple meanings, mm-hmm. just as the word "earth" has multiple meanings. So many people confuse this, but in Genesis chapter ten, the, the word "earth" is used, and in John three sixteen, the word "world" is used. But it, it is obvious in John three sixteen that the word "world" there means the human population, and so that's the use of this, where Jesus sent his disciples out to reach the entire world, mm-hmm. to reach all human beings. Right, right, absolutely. All right, let's go to uh, Loretta in Dundee. Hi, Loretta, you're on the Bob Duco Show with Dr. Grady McMurtry. Yeah, hi, technically in order, that's all right. Oh, well, well, um, well, welcome. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So, um, you know, we often hear the question, Adam and Eve, their children, who did the children marry? Um, so that's my question, and then also if they did marry, like brothers, sisters, was it different back then? Because we're talking about the first human beings in the race, and they, maybe there were no um, negative consequences to that. And I'll listen to your answer. Thank you. All right, Loretta, thank you for your call. Yeah, Grady, the old incest question about well, wait a minute <laughs> yeah. here. Uh, so yeah. some people wonder, oh, where did Cain get his wife? You know, they think that Adam and Eve had only Cain and Abel and then no other children. They forget where it says they had many sons and daughters. But what about that idea of marrying and having children with your brothers and sisters? That sounds so gross. <laughs> <laughs> Well, first of all, that's what happens when you judge history from the present. Exactly. Uh, I I appreciate the question because, first of all, if you'll take a look at Genesis chapter 5, and you take a look at verse 4, your proof text there is that Adam and Eve had many other sons and daughters, and there was no other choice. There was nobody else. They had to marry their brothers and sisters and then eventually their first cousins and so on because there was no alternative. In addition to that, the concept of incest didn't exist until a thousand years after the flood. The concept of incest, the idea of the the marrying of very close relatives, particularly brothers and sisters, was only stopped by God through Moses. Moses being the last man that God would have capable of telling an entire nation that they couldn't do this any longer. And so God knows that because of human sin in the garden, and because of the universal law of decay, mutations in genetic information, that we would get worse and worse genetically over time, which is what we're doing. We're getting worse. We're not getting better. And 2,500 years after creation, God says, okay, you can't marry close relatives anymore because if you do, you're going to get genetic diseases. And to prevent genetic disease, God made the rule you could no longer do that. But even Abraham who is only uh, 300 years or so before Moses, even Abraham married his half-sister, and he's the father of the faith. So again, it wasn't a problem until these mutations had built up to a certain point. God knows this. Now, Moses and the people on earth at the time didn't understand genetics, but as we do today. Mm -hmm. But God does know, and he loves us, and to prevent us from getting genetic diseases, he putting the rule about incest. Now, you have to remember God has a law of marriage. The law of marriage is one man, one woman, united for a lifetime. Doesn't matter what they look like, doesn't matter if they have the same ethnicity, etc. They better speak the same language, but after that, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. However, the law against incest is not a sin law. It is a health law, and you have to separate the two. Right. 
Yeah, it, 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 the point you made early on too is so important that you can't you can't judge history based on the present because there wouldn't have been considered anything even remotely unseemly about Adam and Eve's brothers and sisters marrying and having children. It wouldn't have been genetically bad or dangerous at all it, at that time was, anyway. It, it was not a health problem. Right. It was necessary because there's nobody else. And the law against incest doesn't come until after the flood. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to the phones. 877-8282, Bob. Brian in Detroit. Hey, Brian, welcome. Uh, hi, Bob and, and, and Dr. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Sure. Um, I was. I had a question. Um, it caught my attention when you were talking about having a biblical worldview. And um, so my question is kind of along them lines. It's kind of political. Um, I just I hear a lot that uh, the reason why Trump is not as is so I guess hated so much is because uh, he is a uh, pro-American. He's against um, globalism. So I wonder if you guys could just kind of d- explain what globalism is and, and why you know our country has kind of moved in that direction. Okay. I mean, Trump came along. Uh, Grady, I know that that uh, moves a little bit into the 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 realm of eschatology and such, but but in a general sense, uh, it is true that Donald Trump resists the move toward globalism, one world government, right. the U.S. giving up our sovereignty and having to obey right. uh, the rest of the world. And, and I support President Trump in that area. I don't want to be assimilated into the Borg world of globalism. Uh, and so I'm glad to see the president pushes against that. But uh, what are some Thank of your you. thoughts on that? Oh, I, I agree 110 percent with what you just said. Globalism basically is a concept that says that that uh, there are no national borders. We're all, you know, supposedly, and I and even even the people who want to run us, the communists, don't really think of us as human beings. They think of us as objects which can be used usefully. But the idea of globalism is one world government. And it's really a communistic, socialistic view of the world without borders, and that everybody is supposed to have everything. The problem is, of course, it doesn't work. It never has. It never will. Communism destroys all self-identity, and it also destroys self-worth. It destroys incentive. That's the big thing when it comes to economics. Mm-hmm. Right. Communism destroys incentive. If I'm going to get the same thing that the guy next door is going to get, why should I work harder? Well, what happens is he says the same thing about you. So he stops working, you stop working, and nothing gets done. There's a joke that we tell in Russia, particularly back during the Soviet Union time and so forth. We pretend to work, and they pretend to pay us. Huh. But, of yeah. course, the problem with that is if you don't work, then there's no produce. There's no product. Um, God is a God of profit. I'm not talking about biblical prophets like Elijah. I'm talking about God's a God of profit, P-R-O-F-I-T. But the word profit means a return for effort. It, profit doesn't necessarily mean that you make 10% or you make 100% money on whatever you do. Profit is a return for effort, and God says he expects a return for effort. Every single story of the master giving, um, you know, orders to servants, and then he goes away, and he gives them so much talents, and then he comes back, and there's, a, there's of course, a judgment of how they've done. It wasn't that they had equal success. It was that they had equal faithfulness that was rewarded. This is why we're to work unto the Lord. This is why we're to be, you know, usefully making a profit to sustain our own lives, and we get the living standard that we're willing to put out the effort for. Right. All but right. in communism, it's just equally shared misery. Yeah. Brian, I appreciate uh, your call. Thank you so much. Lindsay in Garden City. Hi, Lindsay. You're on the Bob Duco Show with Dr. Grady McMurtry. Hi, Bob. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. I do. I think I called about this exact same thing probably, I don't know, 10 years ago. So I'm rusty on it, and I've um, been talking with a friend about it, the the Godhead and the Trinity issue. And we know the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the concept of the Trinity. And this friend of mine is stuck on the fact that it says, you know, that Jesus says he's the Son of God or the Son of Man. And I do believe it was Grady 
that I asked this question to so many years ago. Um, and he explained to me that it was more about what the Son of Man meant in that culture as far as the translations went. And so I'm trying to, I was trying to remember so desperately exactly what that explanation was. Mm -hmm. um, that he had given me, and so I was hoping that he could help refresh my memory. Are you that, talking that about could, the what, Grady? It sounds like she's talking about the Daniel seven Son of Man reference. Well, there and also Matthew as he uses it and so forth, but but Son of Man and Son of God are used to speak of Jesus Christ. Period. Now, the concept the Bible tells us is the great Shema of Deuteronomy: "Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God." However, he is revealed in three personalities. He is a triune God, three in one. Mm -hmm. And you see this particularly, for instance, in Isaiah 61, verse 1, when the Holy Spirit of the Father God is upon me, the Son. Jesus quotes that in Luke 4, when he goes back to his hometown in Nazareth. He reads that in the synagogue. And so Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all God. There are many references to that. You know, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father, for we are one. In John 14, for instance, so verses 16 and 17, I, Jesus, will pray to the Father. The Father will send you another, the word meaning in Greek, equal but different. And then Jesus mm -hmm. tells us that he is the, the in Greek, parakletos, but he is the comforter, counselor. He's our lawyer. And he's also named as the Spirit of Truth, that he, the Spirit of Truth, may be with you forever. And so we have the three personalities in one God. So it's really a triune God is the biblical concept. Mm -hmm. Well, he keeps being stuck on the concept of where it says that all things, you know, were created through him. By and him he for really, him, yes. Colossians 1.16. Exactly. So he's like, he's stuck on that, and he's like, well, if it was created through him, then that means he's separate from God. And I, I'm, I'm trying to explain no. to him, and no. and I know no. it's just such a hard concept to to explain to but, somebody but, who's kind of but, stuck but, but on this it. other issue. Yeah, we have a short time. Go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. The mm -hmm. word for God there is Elohim. Elohim is plural. It's not singular. God's, God's name in the singular is El, E-L. But Elohim is mm -hmm. plural. And that is the first revelation of the triune God in Scripture is verse 1. And so here you see that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were all three involved in the creation. And the way that I try to explain it to people is God the Father is the architect. It's his plan. God mm -hmm. the Son is the general contractor. He, he's overseeing the work. And the Holy Spirit is the tradesman. He's the one that's actually doing the work. And all three are there at creation in verse 1. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. Uh, you know, what was that? Can you real quick remind me the Isaiah, you said 61 verse? Verse 1. Reference. Verse 1. 61, okay. 1. Thank you. Yeah. And by the way, Lindsay, can I just say one final thing as well? If you're trying to sure. get somebody to comprehend the Trinity uh, the triune nature of God intellectually, uh, you're going to have a difficult time doing that because there is a measure of faith that we expect, accept in what it says in Scripture because mathematically our brains are limited in being able to understand the true triune nature of God. I mean, for example, when we think of Jesus, Jesus was fully God, but he was fully man. Our brains are limited in their ability to, to comprehend things. So for us, we automatically think that, well, then Jesus was 50% man and 50% God. But no, he wasn't. He was 100% man and 100% God. Then we go, well, doesn't that equal 200%? No, it actually only equals 100%. Same thing with the, the Trinity or the triune nature of God. The Holy Spirit is not 33 and a third percent of God. The Holy Spirit is 100% God. Jesus is 100% God. God the Father is 100% God. Yet they don't equal 300 percent they equal 100 uh, percent god didn't did well, not design our brains to be able to comprehend that in this physical state right now and so that's why we do have to accept by faith what god's word tells us even though we might not be able to intellectually wrap our brains around it but god's word is clear about this 
Yeah, and I wanted to use those things in Scripture that I knew were there, but I just couldn't remember where they were. Sure. And I think I used another reference that I heard on your show. I wasn't sure if it was Grady or someone else, but the example of water, how it's, it can be gas, liquid, or solid, but it's always H2O, no matter what form it's in. Yeah. So I was and, and I would use that concept as well. I mean, I, I've used that. I've used other ones as well, but, but always with a caveat, okay? They're limited because every single one of them are going to have flaws, all right? Because the, the 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 physical properties, if you will, of steam versus ice versus liquid water, uh, you still don't, you know, e even though they can take on different forms, they still don't represent a hundred percent. While the the steam is still there at a hundred percent, and the and the yeah. solid ice is still there at a hundred percent, so there's always going to be flaws in anything you come up with, uh, any kind of analogies that are created like that. So we can. Try Try to use them to partially grasp the different natures of God, but we're, it's none of them are going to be perfectly analogous to the true triune nature of God, of uh, all aspects of Him being fully God. So, yeah. but anyway, the natural cannot fully understand the supernatural. That's right. what you've got to to, to do. Right. With. Anyway, Lindsay, listen, I appreciate your call. Thank you so much. Grady, we're out of time. I wish we had time to get to Chris and Milford. We don't, because Chris wanted to know if it's biblically okay to marry first cousins. Is there a short answer to that? It's advised against, but it wouldn't be illegal. It wouldn't be biblically illegal. Uh, it wouldn't be biblically illegal, but it would be advised against. Genetically, it, 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 it's genetically. too close because uh, after 6,000 years, our, our gene pool it's has too, too watered many, down yeah, too much to become too, too fragile to handle that. That's why the law against incest given by God through Moses right. was to not marry first cousins. Right, right. Uh, folks, it's creationworldview.org. That's the website, creationworldview.org. There's all kinds of information there to prove biblical creation over evolution, all right? And the age of the earth really is only a few thousand years old. And so just all kinds of stuff, creationworldview.org. Go to the website. When you're there, order the newsletter. It's a great newsletter. I've gotten mine for years and years and years, and I know you'll love getting yours too. So creationworldview.org, order the newsletter. Dr. Grady McMurtry. Grady, always talking with you, my friend. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll be thinking <laughs> of you. you tonight as we're watching the uh, conventions again for tonight hey, and tomorrow night. Hey, man, so. we'll watch it together from different places. <laughs> there you go. All right, Grady, thanks a lot. Have a yeah, great day. Okay. We'll see you.